We've got Michael Hetrick, uh, as I said, playing Rug Pod, against Gino here playing Red Green Aggro. So what do you kind of expect out of this matchup? Well, uh, let me, let's get some deck lists over here. I'll take uh, Parallels' deck here. Uh, his deck seems fairly straightforward. Um, he has uh, two Hound of Grizzlebrand, which I guess is a little outside the box. Two copies of Rancor, uh, a red-white sword, and two green-black swords for uh, creature augmentation. And then four copies of Green Sun Zenith, a Thrag Tusk, and then a Sig Slime for utility. And then uh, your general suite of good green guys. So, and I mean, if you guys have followed Michael Hetrick at all, you know he's been playing Rug Pod for a while now. So it's his standard Rug Pod deck. Um, he's found a way to find uh, room for a Viridian Corruptor. Uh, he's got Deceiver, Exar, Metamorph, Zealous Conscripts, that Thrag Tusk, all that stuff. So it's his standard list. Nothing too crazy being changed here. Um, but you'll see on turn two, Hetrick has a Strain Guru Geist. He's in for two against Gino, and Gino is going to follow up with a Strain Guru Geist of his own. So the Geist beats are already off and running. We don't have a very good look at their hands right now. Um, I do see that Hetrick has a Birthing Pod in his yes. hand. Which is one of the key cards in this matchup. Obviously the card advantage that Birthing Pod provides is very difficult to overcome if you don't have Birthing Pod in your own deck. Especially the, the card advantage and the flexibility sure. is very difficult. Very difficult to beat. I, I very rarely see an active Pod defeated. Yes, especially in the Green Mirrors. Uh, I mean, Pod is probably the most important card in the Green Mirrors. Um, and you see Hetrick's going to pay the two life to get this into play. Uh, the threes he can move up to. He's got Borderland Ranger. He has the Seaver Exarch. He has Viridian Corruptor. Um, his threes aren't, you know, they aren't anything, you know, especially exciting. They're, you know, you're not going to find Blaze Splicer here or anything like that. But, I mean, just getting just getting Stranger Guys into a 3-2 and then just getting value out of that card is probably more than enough. Yep. So, uh, Perilous does have the one uh, Acidic Slime in his deck that he can either draw or Zenith for. So... He could potentially get out of this kind of fast, but he's definitely under the gun to either kill Hetrick or break up his pod very fast. Yeah, I mean, you can't leave, as you said, you can't leave pod unanswered. You know, if the card advantage gets out of control too quickly, I mean, uh, basically two activations of the card is is too much to overcome. So we see no attack with Gino here. He's just probably going to want to trade his Stranger Geist for the other Stranger Geist so it doesn't get maximum value. So we'll see what Michael does. What? Hedrick's hand is actually quite bad. Besides, I think he has a, a Thrag Tusk and basically just lands, so... so he can't nothing. actually leverage this too overwhelmingly just yet. And I mean, if that's the case, if his hand is kind of blank, you know, I don't see him trading a Stranger Geist for a counter on the other Stranger Geist or anything like that. He's probably just going to try to get two activations off of it. Yeah, he, he needs to maximize his cards here. He can't be just trading damage like that. So he's going to pod up. We'll see what this one's going to get. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this was Exarch here. Exarch in untapping pod, getting a 4-drop. Yeah, certainly getting uh, a uh, Borderline four... Ranger when he's flooding out here is not uh, that attractive. Yeah, so we'll get the Exarch. And the 4s in his deck are, are Huntmaster of the Fells. He has four of those, of course, and then he has a Phyrexian Metamorph as well. So I would assume um, that we're going to see a Huntmaster of the Fells interplay, but stranger things have happened. I've been wrong before, and I'll be wrong again. <laughs> All right, there's, there's, the, there's yeah. a Lumberjack. So he's going to get a 2-2 Wolf here. Do you, I mean, I think we can agree that we don't like attacking here with the Geist. No way, not with him flooding out. If his hand had more action in it, I could see making an attack, but... Also, that Strangle Root Geist on a perilous side of the board against the Hummaster and the token doesn't do very much, so I wouldn't let him cash it in for any amount of value. It's just, yeah, and that makes sense. Um, looking at Gino's list, I know you have it in front of you. How many bonfires does he have he access to? He has three. To? He has three? Okay. Which is also a way that he can possibly break out of, uh... And you're going to see the Huntmaster flip here because no spells were actually cast. He sacked Strangaroo Geist, um, Deceiver Exarch came into play, untapped Pod, and then he sacked that to get Huntmaster. So no spells were actually played, so that's why the bird is going to die. Pretty awesome interaction between Birthing Pod and, and Huntmaster. Crazy good interaction. Yeah. So, I mean, Gino is behind right now. Um, I mean, Stranger Geist is doing a decent job of holding off attackers and that sort of thing. Uh, I mean, 4-4 Huntmaster is still going to be... Or, yeah, 4-4 Flip Huntmaster is still going to be pretty difficult to deal with. No action from Gino this turn either. Yeah, I, I wish we could get a better view of his hand here because... I don't really imagine what he could be sitting on. 
Um, taking a decent look at Michael's hand, there's a Kessig Wolf run in his hand. He also just drew an, a, another Huntmaster of the Fells. And I mean, with him being able to play Huntmaster and activate Pod for two life, and the two life that he gains from Huntmaster, pretty much negating that, he's going to uh -huh. be able to get into five, the five range now. And his fives in his deck are Zealous Conscripts, uh, Thrag Tusk, which is in his hand, and then Wolfer Silverheart, which is, I think you would agree, one of the most important cards in Green Mirrors. Yeah, for sure. Um, and basically, Perilous needs to get himself in the position where uh, Bonfire of the Dam is still actually a live draw for him. Once that window's closed, there's no hope of him getting out from here. Yeah, there's no comeback in sight. And if if Mr. Hedrick is going to search for Wolf or Silver Art like I believe he's going to, and there's the big bad wolf himself, um, Gino's in some trouble. Yeah, that closes that door. Yeah. Now, now, now Bonfire isn't even enough to get him out. Yeah. So. The bonfire window is basically closed. He had a turn to draw last turn where it would have been reasonable. Yeah. You know, it would have killed his guy. It would have killed uh, Hedrick's Geist and his Wolf. Wouldn't have killed his Huntmaster, um, but it would have been a, you know a reasonable draw to get him right. back in the game. Yeah. And it would have also broken up his chain for the time being because you can't pot up off of the off of the flip Huntmaster. Right. Yeah. Hedrick still had the. Thrag Tusk left over in his hand, so he would have been able to rebuild from there, but it would have at least slowed him down for a little bit. It would have given Gino a little bit of hope to get back into the game. Right. Running bonfire draws or the acidic slime might have been uh, able for it. Well, it might have been enough for him to claw back in, but now uh, things are out of control. Yeah. He's he's behind now. I mean, I'm not really sure what draws he has available to him to get back in this game. Typically, this is the kind of spot where bonfire kind of pulls you back into games when you miracle it, but. As you said, I mean, Silverheart being an 8-8 and getting plus 4, plus 4 to something, it's just too slow. He probably has a Silverheart of his own here. Okay, oh, he has a slime. slime. So, that is something, at least. Uh, I think the uh, the Wolf Run in, in Hetrick's hand is ultimately going to be too much on this attack. But, in theory, the, the Slime does hold back some of his attacks because he doesn't want to, obviously, trade his, uh, his Silverheart for it. But... The trample land represents. Oh, no, we're just getting a That's concession. That's just a concession. Okay, okay sure. <laughs> the trample land, obviously, Hetrick did a nice job of slow rolling that. Yeah. Obviously, you know, that's the last line. That's the last line that you want to play, ideally, so that you can get the maximum effect out of it. Um, and that's basically what was going to happen that game. And the information is significant too. You of don't, course. Yeah. You don't want. Gino has no idea that he has that in his deck right now, which right. is important. Um, looking at Michael's sideboard for this sort of matchup. Um, and I'm a big proponent of red green, as you guys may know at home. I mean, he's got three art trails here, which is a really important card in the mm -hmm. green mirrors. Um, being able to control uh, the eight mana accelerants is a really, really big deal because you don't want to get behind very quickly. Um, you're also going to find two Bonfire the Damned in, in Michael's deck list. And we've already gone over how important that is. But if you guys have ever played or Miracle Bonfire the Damned in green mirrors, you guys obviously probably know how important that card is as well. What do you think the relationship is between Miracleing it and winning the game? What's the percentage um, correlation? The correlation is probably fairly high. Really, I don't want to say 90 100. 90 something. 95, yeah. 96. I don't want to go 100. <laughs> um, you're going to find a, another Wolf for Silverheart, so he's going to have access to two after sideboard. Uh, two more Zealous Conscripts is going to bring him up to three. Um, and there's another Borderland Ranger uh, in his sideboard. And when you're on the draw and it's about hitting land drops, I could see him boarding that in on the draw. Um, so he's definitely got some options available to him. Um, Hedrick also has an Ancient Grudge, which I don't think he's going to find use of, and three Hell Riders as well, which just aren't that impressive in Green Mirrors. It's more for the control matchup. So. Yep. On the other side of the table, uh, we have um, two copies of Ancient Grudge you may want uh, to fight over Birthing Pod, although that's always sort of a dubious way of trying to fight it. Uh, one copy of uh, Thunder Maw Hellkite, which I assume is, is quite good here. Good in Green Mirrors, for yeah. sure. Um, uh, uh, Zealous Conscript, also potentially very good here. I mean, he has a, a lot of different kind of big utility guys that he can bring in. Another Silverheart. I'm not exactly sure what distribution of big guys that he wants to have here is. Uh, but, um, I mean, a Thrag Tusk seems very bad in this matchup because Hedrick is so good at just clogging up the board. And Hedrick's actually is also so much better at going over the top that Gino just needs to play a fast beat down game. He can't try to attrition down the ground. He just needs to get him dead as fast as he can. Because yeah. the longer the game go the longer the game goes, the more gummed up the board gets and then that's when Pod starts to get its advantages. Yeah. And then you know he's gonna be too far behind. Because Hetrick Hetrick has more card advantage in his deck. Uh, and Gino's deck is more aggressive. You know, he has Rancors as you said, he has Hound of Crystal Brand, that sort of thing. So he needs to be the aggressor in the sideboard games and try to just get the games over as fast as he can. Cool. And and oddly enough I actually think Rancor 
Renker actually might be dubious in this matchup for the same reason that Hedrick's just so good at clogging up the ground uh, that it might not, like you might be better off just trying to stick a sword on something, which is going to be a little bit harder for Hedrick to fight through. Sure. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of interesting because like I can see I can see spots where Rancor is bad. I can also see spots where Rancor is fairly yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely swingy here. Um, I mean, a, a card like Hound of Gristlebrand is a card that obviously wants to carry a Rancor. Yes. Um, and he has another one in his sideboard. So, I mean, that card alone is it's fairly good in Green Mirrors. Um, you know, with the, the interaction with Kessig Wolf Run, interaction with Wolfer Silverheart, interaction with Rancor makes it a pretty reasonable threat. Um, but there are times where Rancor is going to be fantastic, and there are other times, as you said, where it's going to be below average. Yeah. So, I would actually be I mean, Rancor's raw power level is so high that I would be surprised if he actually cut them on the play. But I can see on the draw just not being the not, type of... Not the, being anywhere near as good. Yeah, the, the odds that the game actually breaks correctly where Rancor's appreciably adding your clock probably only occurs in games where Hedrick's draw is quite bad. And... You know, that's a common uh, common dilemma with sideboarding or whatever that I see a lot of players encounter is, you know, is this, when this card is going to be good, is it only in circumstances where my opponent's draw is bad? Sure. And I don't need to enhance my draws that much when my opponent's draw is bad. What I need to do is have cards that are going to be good when my opponent's draw is average or better. Okay. And Ranker on the draw probably doesn't, doesn't meet that qualification, I would guess. I would agree with your point as well. Um, you, now, you brought up the point uh, just a minute ago about Ancient Grudge coming in to deal with um, Birthing Club. Now, I've always, myself, I've never been a big proponent of boarding in Ancient Grudge against just the card Birthing Pod because, you know, if, if he doesn't draw Birthing Pod, then I've essentially mulliganed. Whereas if he's drawn if he's drawn Birthing Pod, my card is fantastic, but it, it's very dependent on him drawing it because there aren't a lot of targets in his deck. He has four Birthing Pods, and then he has... A Phyrexian Metamorph. Those are the only targets. Yep. So how do you feel, like, from a sideboarding aspect, of boarding in a narrow card like Ancient Grudge that's only good against a certain card in his deck? Now, obviously, Birthing Pod's one of the most powerful cards in his deck, but it's not... He doesn't need it to win. I would... I, I generally speaking, if I'm an aggressive deck, I do not like setting in cards that are purely reactive and do not cover a large swath of their cards. Um, in general, the way the stars have to align for it to be good... Uh, it looks like uh, Perilous here is taking a mulligan. Yes. Is not only do you have to draw the Grudge, and he has to draw the Birthing Pod, but uh, you have to you actually have a very small window for that to even occur. Because if he pods for two turns, and then you rip your Grudge, you're probably still buried by what happened in the, in the two turns previous. Uh, also, Hedrick's deck has the possibility of winning without Birthing Pod. You can just start casting his big guys. Sure. And just like just you know, can just ramp up into his big guys. So. I would not want to have Ancient Grudge in my deck here. Okay. Uh, even though you are going to lose some percentage of games to Birthing Pod, where maybe you don't lose that game, that specific game if you were able to grudge it right away, I think in total sum, the cost of drawing a dead card, drawing it but it doesn't matter, uh, just I think that percentage of games is much higher okay. than the percentage of games where you draw a grudge and it's perfect for the spot that you're in. Sure. And it, as we talked about, you know, for from Gino's perspective and what he needs to accomplish in this matchup is he needs to be aggressive as possible. So by diluting his deck with a card like Ancient Grudge to be reactive is probably not going to facilitate his game plan. Yes. So he can't afford to do it. Um, they're both going to six here. Uh, looking at Michael's deck list just really quickly, um, you know, we're bringing up the point that he can just play a normal game without Birthing Pod. And the reasons he's able to do that, you know, we obviously we, we went over his sideboard, um, more Wolfers, Silver Hearts, and that sort of thing. He has four Huntmasters, but he also has four Green Sun Zenith in his deck. So he can just play like a normal green deck. Obviously, um, you know, when, his, when he has Birthing Pod in play and he's activating it, then his deck is on steroids. Yeah. But if he is not Birthing Podding like he was last game, he is still able to just play normal Magic. But it might be difficult when he's going to five cards now. Yes. Yeah, this is definitely it is definitely way worse, I think, I believe, for uh, Hedrick's deck to Mulligan than the average standard deck. Um, now, Birthing Pod can catch you up from there, but his deck is so much about, like, mixing and matching kind of different parts that you're way more likely to get this awkward hand that doesn't really go anywhere when you're on fewer cards, as opposed to a deck like, uh, like Perilous's, which is just a lot more homogenous. His mulligans to five are likely to be a lot better. And you, know, you can talk about how good Bonfire the Damned is by itself because it is one of the best cards in the format, but it's even better when your opponent is mulliganing and you know they're going to e be even more reliant on their mana elves. And that's, they, when it, that's when the card just normally being cast is even, is even more powerful. And they don't even have the option of playing around it either, which is the other big thing. Yeah, they just have to play their threats and you know hope that things work out their way. 
Um, we have Gino starting off with just the turn one birds, and we've got a follow up here of Borderland. turn two Borderland Ranger, which will probably fetch out one of his mountains. I would assume we don't need the uh, third forest here. So. I do not think we're going to need a third forest here. That's going to go get a mountain that's going to turn on his red cards like Huntmaster, like Bonfire. Uh, looking at, at Hetrick's hand, you see a Zealous Conscript, you see a Birthing Pod. I see a, a grip full of other red cards, and I believe a mountain as well. Yeah, it looks like. I can't tell if one of those cards is an art trail, but if it is, it's going to be reasonable here. And he draws another Hinterland Harbor, which is clearly a little bit awkward. I assume that is not a birthing pod, in the, uh, sorry, an art trail in his hand, as he would have just, this is about the best spot you can imagine for casting it. We, I see, a, one of those cards is definitely Bonfire. The yes. Gun, so. We'll see if that's going to be able to catch him up. The Hound of Gristlebrand, one of the more important cards in the mirror. Uh, Gino's going to swing in for two. Uh, Hound of Gristlebrand is, of course, in play. It's passing back to Mr. Hedrick. Bird of Paradise is the draw. Any game plan for you this game, Patrick, as far as you can I'm tell? I'm not even sure. I, I, I mean, sir, I do not think that he can afford to pay two and cast Pod on an empty board. That, does, that doesn't seem like a recipe for success. I think he's almost just priced into casting his bird here. I mean, Bonfire for one is no good. Yeah. Uh, bonfire, I mean, if he draws Miracle, Bonfire next turn for two, it, you know, the current board state makes it look okay. But I can't imagine just playing Birthing Potting passing. I think he has to cast his bird. I think uh, he has yeah, to cast I his don't, bird. I don't see a better... I mean, that play... Uh, all right, we're going to we're gonna dial up the pod. All right. He, he disagrees with us. That's fine. But that's fine. Won't be the... Wasn't the first time, won't be the last. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of that today. <laughs> and that's okay. That's okay. So Gino's, of course, in an enviable spot right now. He's got a, a solid board presence. We can't really get a good look at his hand, but, I mean, all things considered, he's very ahead on the board as is, that we don't even need to see his hand. Any follow-up to this is going to be fairly good. And that's not bad at all. Crushing Vines is going to take care of that birthing pod, which, for for lack of a better term, is basically a time walk. Yep. And and uh, Hetrick dealt himself two points of damage, so that's a pretty crushing turn. Do you like the puns? Not that one so much. Okay, I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Forest for Hetrick is a reasonable draw. I mean, he still has a bonfire draw here. Bonfire is always live. I mean, he has enough, and he has enough lands to do it and make it relevant. Now I see. He has two bonfires two, in his hand. Two bonfires in his hand. So I guess we we actually don't have that draw. Well, he's got. Th he's oh, got, he's got three. He's, he's got, got three okay, total. Three after board. He's got a bonfire for one to take care of the elf. Maybe slow him down a little bit. Try to keep him off of Wolfier Silverheart or Zenith for Wolfier Silverheart, which is I think that's a pretty. All things considered, I think that plays perfectly fine. Yeah, you're not gonna. You have to. You can't just not cast your spells in this spot. You're behind on the board. You have a very small window. You just have to cast what you can cast for any sort of value. Gino has a Kessig Wolf uh, run. Uh, it's going to make our friend Mr. Hound of Gristlebrand more dangerous down the road. I mean, dangerous enough at, it's danger, dangerous enough now. Strangerroot Geist. We're going to come on in for it looks to be eight. And that, I mean, the Strangerroot Geist, he was already in bad shape. His, bon, his bonfire was already not going to be great, but it's even worse now because of two undying, undying creatures in play. A Miracle One isn't anything special. And you see that he drew a forest there. So this game, for all intents and purposes, is probably over. Yeah, he can bonfire for two, or cast his Ellis Conscripts and not do anything, or concede, which is what he ultimately decided upon. So, I mean, that game was more or less decided by, by Michael's Mulligans. Um, didn't really get to play the game of match that he wanted to play. Um, I didn't really see any sideboard cards drawn by Gino. I guess he did draw a Crushing, the, the crushing Vines. He drew the Crushing Vines for the Birthing Pod. Which was not terribly relevant, but it doesn't hurt that he had it. Yeah, certainly that was an ideal spot of Patrick going turn one pass, turn two pass, turn three pay two pod. That's about the best game plan you can script for having your uh, artifact destruction matter. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think that much changed on the sideboard. Now, I know that you said, I guess some things may change that I haven't really taken into account. I know that you said you may want to sideboard out ranker on the draw. Yeah, uh, like I said, I think that it's very likely to assist you only when uh, there's something wrong with Hedrick's draw because his his deck is so good at clogging up the ground. Okay. But I'm no uh, I'm no expert in when it comes to the red green versus blue red green pod matchup. But my instincts are that uh, that that ranker is pretty dubious on the draw. 
Well, oddly enough, I'm a, I, I kind of am an expert in that Sort area. of an aficionado. Yeah, I, I kind of enjoy the red-green deck online. Um, and, you know, what I have found is that, um, you know, Gino's deck list is much different than mine. But the same sort of role assessment and ideas apply. Mm -hmm. Bonfire is very, very important in the mirror, which won't surprise you at all. And when you're on the draw, you know, you want to try to get your mana doors out there as much as you can and, and make your make your Miracle Bonfire as powerful as you can to clear the board up. Now, he has some cards in his deck that are different than what I typically play. Hound of Gristlebrand is very, very powerful in Green Mirrors. Uh, double Strike and Undying and the interaction with Kessig Wolf Run, all very, very powerful things. Yeah. So he has some things going on his end that, that typical red-green decks don't have. Um, overall, I would agree with your point of warding out Rancor because a lot of things are going to have to go right for Rancor to be as good as it can possibly be. Much better card on the play than the draw. So from um, Hedrick's perspective, yes, you had mentioned the three art trails in the sideboard. What are your thoughts on that versus uh, Pillar of Flame? They're slightly different cards, obviously, but they apply, they are for similar matchups. Yes. Um, it's interesting. Because in this matchup, our trail is going to be able to, to kill, you know, ideally, a uh, best case scenario, um, the, the copy of Huntmaster of the Fells plus a bird, yeah. which is really, really good. Um, but at the same time, Pillar of Flame is more flexible because it only costs one mana, and it can just take care of a bird, take care of his mana accelerant right away, and then you can just push far ahead. Our trail costing two mana is actually fairly relevant versus the one mana. It's also better against undying creatures. Which yes. Is another big thing. And with Geno's deck list where he has three Hunt Masters after sideboard and a grip full of Strain Guru dice, Pillar would be better. Yep. Um, it's fairly close, actually. Uh, on you know, It depends on what you want to accomplish. You know, on, on what you what you're looking to do. You know, if, if Michael feels his deck is fairly good against zombies, for example, you know, then he doesn't think that he needs Pillar of Flame to take care of a card like Grave Crawler, take care of Draw Messenger, that sort of thing. I think the cards are very, very close and very similar, as you said. Um, but I think that you know, playing Art Trail just is saying, in Michael's point of view, that he wants to be better off against green, and he's okay being a little bit lesser against a deck like zombies. Yeah. The mana difference, though, you know. The difference between one and two mana may not seem like a lot, but it's a pretty big difference, especially in a deck like this that's going to maximize its mana every turn with Birthing Pod and casting its threats. So it looks like we're both keeping seven, and yeah. Mr. Hetrick is off with the Birds of Paradise. So his hand looks like a bunch of red cards, a forest, and a, a blue-green land. So if this bird gets killed, he might not be able to cast very much, and he just ripped a pod, so... All right, so 18, I, I see that um, those look like Hellriders in his hand to me, is what I, I, think, there what was I a, think there I was, saw. I believe there was an Art Trail. There's a Bonfire. There's a Bonfire. I think there was another pod there. I'm almost positive one of those cards is Hellrider, if not both of the other red cards. You gotta Which kill is, that bird. You gotta kill that bird. Yeah, that bird needs to die if you can kill you it. You got a Bonfire or something, you gotta... Hey, you can't be too proud to no. Bonfire for one. I know it's a mythic. I know the card's like twenty-five dollars. Don't be too proud yeah, just, to kill that bird of paradise right now, because things are going to get out of control if they, if that bird stay alive. Stays alive, excuse me. And I actually think Hedrick's hand might actually go to trash if the bird dies too. I think he's basically all in on this thing. Okay. All right. Okay. Not a bad play. I don't hate. I don't. I don't hate it. Let's see what he draws. Stranglerud Geist. Geist. Now I know that I know that um, I know that Michael has a Brilliant Corruptor in his in his starting sixty. Not sure if he left it in or not. You have to imagine it's reasonable insurance. It's also potentially an answer to an Undying creature as well. Or no, 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 that interaction doesn't work. That interaction does not work. No. No, but it is still an out to the swords, and it's reasonable to assume that Perilous has a few in his deck somewhere. Now things get a little things get a little bit tough here, and I'm interested to see your line of play here because you know the threat of a sword is imminent on the table. Yep. He just drew a Stranger Root Geist, which he can sacrifice. He can sacrifice the Birthing Pod, get his Stranger Root Geist back as a three-two, and he can get Borderland Ranger to ensure that he hits his land drop, or he can get Radiant Corruptor if it's still in his deck to take care of the sword. Which pathway would you take? Uh, I think that I would probably just get the sword off the table because uh, just the risk of. The upside on Perilous's turn, if that sword sticks, is just, I believe it's just too high. Okay. So I guess we'll find out if the, uh, if the Corruptor's still in this deck right now. 
Because Borderland Rage is going to kind of turn on his hand. Okay. And I, you know, I assume he's going to search for a mountain. It's going to turn on his hand now. Of course, Bonfire is still very, very, very good here. As it is wont to be. He's going to get to play his mountain. He's getting closer to turning his hand on. And he's going to get in for three points of damage here as well with the with the Stranger Root Dice with the Undying, tr the, uh, the plus one, plus one counter on it. Go to Gino's turn. Is it is it Bonfire o'clock? Not, no, not quite like a yet. Bonfire. So now it's decision making time for Gino, and I wish we had more information on what his hand was. But I mean, the first the first thing that he's going to have to decide yeah, this is, is a, if this it's is a freebie. Time. Okay. This is a freebie. You're going to throw away a spare birthing pot, I guess. All right, so Birthing Pod's going to bite it. What Gino doesn't know is that he is going to be under a lot of pressure this turn if that bird doesn't die. Because now the Hellrider is going to come through. Zenith for one, which means he's light on land. Yeah, I mean, he didn't play a land before attacking with a sword, which is something of a, a giveaway that he was without a third land drop. So, And now the, pre the pressure is going to be on now because not only... Does Hetrick have Bonfire the damage in his hand? But he also has Hellrider. And I mean, looking at Hellrider this turn, assuming he doesn't, yeah. assuming he doesn't draw a land, he's going to be three, six, seven, eight, nine. And that's eleven points of damage, and he's at seventeen. And that's assuming that he doesn't draw a land. Yeah. Because if he does draw a land, he can play Hellrider, turn that bird into another Stranger Root Ice, and get in for even more damage. Yeah. And then he's also a little bit better covered against um, bon up Bonfire. Then, yeah. That's right, an doing an trail. I mean that's that's a fine draw. Um, you know it's probably going to shore up the later the later parts of this game. Just that two points of damage over to Gino, but I think that Hellrider is going to come into play this turn, and we're just going to put him under the gun. I mean, you don't, do you do you think there's an argument here for just going Artrail your bird and you for two, and pod my bird into a strangle root, guys? Because it gives you like a ton of insurance against uh, bonfire. It's on the bonfire. Top. I don't think that would have been bad. I'm just gonna pod this away. So maybe now we see the Corruptor, or maybe now we just see another Borderland Ranger for a moment. I mean, if he has the Corruptor in his deck too, then this play is much better because he gets to blow up the sword and then. Okay, yeah, this is much better. And now he's gonna archer both the guy, yeah. sure. And then he's just too far behind, sure. This play also seems fine. <laughs> both the things are gonna die. Yeah. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Michael Hedrick, not bad at all. It's not even even Miracle Bonfire is off now, and he also yeah his sword is gone. Both his mana dorks are gone. Yeah. He stalled on lands. He stalled on lands. That's gonna happen, and now Hellrider is gonna come to play to take care of things. So this is a wrap. Archer, I guess, was a better draw than we gave it credit for. He, I mean, he had a lot of lines available to him. I think he drew. Yeah, he drew. He drew bonfire this and just, turn, just, and he's just, yeah, yeah he's like, yeah. I don't need it. All right. But as Hetrick goes through the steps of what he's going to do this turn, between pot activations, casting a, casting a bonfire or, or hell rider, you know, what these matches typically come down to, Patrick, as you saw, it's all about the man accelerants. Yes. And if they can stay in play, and, you know, if they do stay in play, then you can accelerate to your large starts too quickly. But it also... It also shows just how powerful of a card Birthing Pot is when it goes unchecked for one, or as we have found in in the first in this game, it, it all it takes is two turns. Yeah, and that's and that's part of the reason that bringing, I, like I said, I believe bringing in the artifact removal is a little dodgy, just because there's no guarantee that this even, like, if you were to draw a grudge in any of these turns, it wouldn't have even matter particularly much, you know? Yeah. I mean, casting a, casting a grudge is... I mean, it's killing his birthing pot, it's killing one of the threats, but it's also taking up his entire turn. Yeah. And it now, would have been good on the turn where he had sort of sort of quit. Hit him. Un untap. That turn it would have been good, but any other turn in the game it would have been... It would have been a one-for-one -one and trade off his turn at best. Yeah. And then we're in a position here where it just doesn't even matter. And so now uh, on Hetrick's turn, he could have cast Hellrider, absolutely, but he just wants to shore up the game. 
make sure that Gino is basically can't do anything, so he just sacrifices Viridian Corruptor to Birthing Pod, got Huntmaster, Huntmaster flips because no spells were cast, shoots down the bird, shoots Gino for two. And Gino is still in the same terrible situation of, I need to draw lands, my bonfires are off, there's nothing I can really do to get myself out of this predicament. So, alright. Borderland Ranger, you're a little late. Yeah, a little late to the party here. Is Hellrider just lethal from here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I guess, yeah, it's, it's lethal. It looks to be lethal, right? Especially because the four, four tramples. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Yeah. yeah. Hellrider will do it in. Lethal plus change. It's interesting that he boarded these in. I didn't expect him to do that. Um, how do you feel about that, just overall, Hellrider coming in, in in this sort of matchup? I mean, it's a little bizarre, but uh, it's possible that he has other utility cards that he simply doesn't want in his deck. Like, the two Phantasmal images are probably a little dodgy against a deck that has Kessig Wolf run. Okay. Uh, and it's possible that he just has enough cards that are in that sort of space that uh, they're just upgrades over other weird bolts he would never want to get. Like, it's possible he doesn't want the Metamorph if the guy's bringing an artifact removal. Like, there's enough pieces that you could reasonably want to cut that they're just... And there's a concession. Yeah, there's a concession. And, and what he did that turn is he just cast Hellrider, sacrifices Borderland Ranger to get Metamorph to copy his Hellrider in for God knows how much damage and take yeah. care of the game. So, Michael Hetrick, Ship It Holla on Magic Online is 1-0 with his uh, with his Roycott deck, the deck yeah. that he loves playing. He got second place at the Indianapolis Invitational with it. Um, he has lost in the finals of a Magic Online PTQ. He is very, very adept with this deck. Doesn't surprise me at all to see him here with it this weekend. Yeah, no, and his lines on, on some of his lines there were showing that he was thinking, you know, two, three, four turns ahead about what his progression was going to be with his pods and whatever the case may be. Uh, so I think it's very predicated on, uh, again, what kind of metagame you're expecting. Okay. And Kibler's, I think Kibler's deck is probably struggles much more in the current metagame, which is much more about the four copies of Birthing Pod and decks that go all the way up to the top. Sure. Where his deck is just not very well suited for this. So we're going to be joining Game 3 in progress. We have Eric Froelich on the left uh, versus Nate Watts on the right. You can see the life totals are fairly low, 7-4, to four, uh, in favor of Mr. Watts. Um, Eric has a Talon run in play along with a counter, and we see a Phantasmal image copying something. We're not entirely sure what right now. Uh, and we're looking at a 6-6 six, six Dungrove Elder on Nate's side. This game is very, very close, uh, joining it in progress, and we see a Green Sun Zenith going on the stack for five. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what this gets. Could it be the Bellowing Tanglewood? Well, we can, we can figure out if there's one to go get. Does he have one no. hiding in there? No Bellowing Tangleworm hiding. Um, looking at Eric's deck list, Eric, as you guys can see in the top, is playing Blue Green Delver. Um, it's a bit of a take on Adam Prozac's deck, um, but there are some Queer and Dryads that have made their way into here, along with some green cards in his sideboard, some Thrag Tusk as well. Okay, so Thrag Tusk is going to keep him alive. Um, it's going to put him up to 12 life and also present a relevant threat. It's also likely going to let this Dungrove Elder get on in there rather safely. Um, I know we see that Eric has a couple cards in his hand. I'm clearly not very sure what they are right now. Um, but this Zenith resolving for Nate seems to be rather relevant, and Dungrove is going to be the Abyss every turn because it's attacking for lethal right now. <laughs> Although getting the Thrag Test before combat, maybe he wanted the information, but it's a, a little dodgy because I believe that image is on the Strangler of Geist. So this allows him to, to chump and copy on the Thrag Test, which is a... Okay, that quite is... A, a yeah, quite a bit of value for, for Froelich right now, given where his board is and how, uh, how important his life total is. So he was at 7, and it's copying Thrag Tusk now, which is going to give him 5 more life. He was at 7, and my assumption is that he would cast that pre-combat because he wants to see if it's going to resolve yeah. you know, in, in the face of Manali, and then he'll be able to decide his turn that way. But I understand where you're coming from. You know, If there's only a Strangler Root Geist, if Phantasm is a Strangler Root Geist, the things that it can come back as are the 2-2 two, two, the two, two Drake token. It can't come back as Dungrove Elder. I mean, it can, but that's not really a very good use yeah. of the card. <laughs> it can't come back as Talaron because that's a legend. So playing Thrag Tusk pre-combat looks like it's done more harm than it's done good right. for Nate at this point. Yeah, it, it, it can only be correct there if you are you just need the information about whether your Xena is going to resolve to make your attack. But it didn't look like that was really a thing. 
um, because the Dungrove Elder can't, he's not really blocking very efficiently here. Like, if Prolix hands a bunch of instants, you're going to lose anyway. Yes. But, I mean, uh, uh, there's nothing that you can do about all of the instants. Yeah. You know, they're going to make the 2-2 two -two Drakes. He doesn't look to have an answer to it. Um, so I don't really like it being cast pre-combat. Yeah. I think it's gonna. I think it's only gonna do more harm than it's done good. But we shall see. Is hopefully we can get a good look as Eric immediately covers his hand. Yeah. So we'll be seeing nothing. Thank you very much. Are we just? Was that? A, I see spectral flight. A spectral flight. Which can put Tower on upstairs. Up, uh, you know, of course we can't yeah. target our friend Mr. Thrag Tusk image. Wouldn't be the smartest of plays. Talorin's going to go upstairs. We're going to get in for 2 4 6 upstairs. We'll put him to 6. Which puts uh, Watts on a one turn clock here. And we're going to see what kind of follow up we, we can have here. We tap, we draw. He was drawing his card as though he had a miracle to draw. Does he have Revenge of the Hunted in his 75? Yes, he has three copies. Okay. He drew rather dubious. Yeah. I had a feeling <laughs> that he may have a miracle hiding in there somewhere. All right, so in with both. And that's going to block. His, his copy of Thratus is going to block Dungrove Elder. So they're going to trade off here. Um, no, tr yes, there actually is a trade because no forest. Yeah, 6-6 six, six into, I forgot the Undying Counter. So yeah. there's actually going to be a trade, and he's going to get a 3-3 three, three beast. i hoping that Eric does not have a forest in his hand. He's just going to pass back. He'll... Body language. Not not promising. Not promising. Looking a little dejected. Ephra, I feel like Ephra has some instance in his hand, but he's just going to wait. Yeah. It's always fine to start off your turn by just attacking for a lethal. And we'll see where and it goes we'll see, from there. Yeah, yeah. See what happens from there. No, yeah. no reason to rush anything. And this, this is a lethal attack, and, and that's an extension yep. of the hand. So Eric Froelich... Takes down the match two to one against Nate Watson in his mono green Dungrove Elder deck. You know, uh, you know, of course, we we didn't see all of the match or anything like that. But what we did see, it feels like to me that the casting of Green Sun Zenith before attacking with Dungrove Elder may have just cost him the game. I mean, it certainly gave Frolic a much better target for his Phantasmal image. 